You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 78 and the first episode of the new year. Happy 2020. Yeah. So welcome back. It's missed you since last year. It's been a whole year. Whew. Oh, man. <laughs> Today we're talking about exaptation. What? Yeah. Exaptation is an interesting scientific term, both in what it represents and in the history and current culture around it. So exaptation generally, we're going to go in more detail, but generally is the idea of when a trait evolved from one purpose is repurposed for a side purpose, for a different feature. And that repurposing or co-option, as you'll, often, you'll also hear it called all the time, is exaptation. One trait repurposed for another purpose. And this is an interesting term because it's a young one. And is still being fairly heavily debated today. Yeah, a little bit controversial. So we're going to go into it. We'll go into the history. What are the ex what are the classic given examples for it? What is some of the research that has been done to try to support or look for it? And what is that debate? Why is there a debate? All that good stuff. This episode was also requested by two of our listeners, Rafa and our patron Lydia. Hey, thanks. So thank you for the requests. And before we move on, announcements. So speaking of Patreon, as we like to do, if you get new patrons at a certain level, we like to shout their names out here on the podcast. So some of those new names are Charlie, Sarah, and George. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks. And continuing to speak about Patreon, for anyone who is new... Our podcast is now fully funded by our patrons on Patreon, which is and, wonderful. And then some. Yes, and then some, which has led us to do cool trips and upgrade our equipment and all sorts of things like that. If you sign up, you get extra bonus material. You get to chat at us on Patreon and things like that. But also, if you sign up at certain levels, you can send questions to us for us to answer, quote unquote, live here on the podcast. Yeah, if you sign up at a certain level, you'll get a message mm -hmm. from us with a link to a form where you can submit questions. And those questions we will do some background research on and then answer at the end of an episode. We make a point to announce that here because we're all out of questions. So if you have questions that you're itching to ask and you want us to say them out loud, send them to us because we, we need to fill that list up. Yeah, and if you're not a patron that can send us in questions now might be the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're in a drought of questions sure are come help us out <laughs> our next announcement has to do with a cool one of those cool trips we were able to go on funded by patreon uh is when we went to dragon con almost half a year ago now <laughs> it's been it's been a few months and while we were there we did a paleontology hour panel yes with trevor valley and karen heading which we were able to record we sure did and we were going to put it together as an episode to share with all of you. We sure were. Which we have now. We sure have. <laughs> so keep an eye out. It's finally happening. Yes. This month, January, it will be up not too long after this episode goes up. We, we were daunted by the process of editing it, which turned out to be not that daunting a process. So we'll do better next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, actually, now that we know that it works, next this year when we go to Dragon Con, we can schedule in the time mm -hmm. to prepare it and edit it and all that so that it won't take as long this yes. time. <laughs> so keep an eye out for that. It'll be pretty good. And with that, we're all out of announcements. Okay. So now... We move on to our first section, the news. The first news of a new year. Yeah, new news. In the news section, we always like to take a chance and cover some of the recent science discoveries and publications and researches that have happened within the last couple of weeks. Pick a couple of our favorites, bring them to you all to share, to share with each other, and keep us all up to date. So to start us off for the 2020, take it away, David. Okay. I'm going to start with news about plants, because, you know, they just don't get that much love. Yeah, they're a good way to start 2020. This is research. It's actually from the end of 2019, but yeah, it's the news <laughs> 2020. About what appears to be 
the oldest known forest. Ooh. Which is pretty fun. This is research by William Stein et al. in the journal Current Biology, and we'll link to an article on live science by Rafi Letzter. We talked about forests and trees in episode 73, in which we laid out a very convincing case, along with our friend Allie, that forests are kind of a big deal. A little important. They, once trees uh, show up and start developing forests on the earlier ecosystems on our planet, they dramatically change what life looks like on the surface, how nutrients are moved throughout the surface, they change the atmosphere. It's kind of a big deal. So understanding the earliest forests is part of understanding one of the biggest transformations our continents have gone through. In this new study, researchers looked at a fossil soil, also known as a paleosol, there's a vocab word for you, in the Catskills in New York, uh, in near a town called Cairo. What they mainly found, the evidence of this forest, is in the form of fossilized roots. The first and most interesting thing about this forest is that it is from the Devonian around 386 million years ago. Wow. That's significant because, number one, it's before, it's the period before the Carboniferous, which is the famous big forest and all that. And also because this puts it about two or three million years older than the next known oldest forest, which itself happens to also be in New York, about 25 miles west of this one, in a place called Gilboa. They're actually in the same stratigraphic sequence, so the most obvious way we know that this new one is older is that it's lower in the sequence, okay. estimated to be a couple million years older. The second thing that's interesting about it is the composition that they found. They were able to identify the remains of three different types of trees. All of them are spore-producing trees. So back in episode 73, we talked about how early trees weren't doing the seed thing like trees do today. They were reproducing with spores, sort of like some, you know, some very early branching, branching evolutionarily, not tree-wise, <laughs> plants in the plant family tree. One of the groups is a type of tree called Eospermatopterus, which is described as tree fern-like, which is not a big surprise to find here. It's also in that slightly younger uh, uh, environment, the slightly younger site nearby. What the authors point out is interesting about finding this one is that previously researchers have proposed that this type of tree fern-like plant was restricted to wetter environments, but this new environment appears to have been a drier region. So they suggest that these may have been more widely dispersed. They may have been more able to succeed in different types of ecosystems. And they describe them as maybe even having a weed-like habit. Oh, cool. That, it, you know, if if you can grow there, they'll grow there. Yeah, is kind it, of thing. Is, there, is it wet and there's some dirt? All right, cool. Yep. Another of, of the trees that they found was not identified specifically, but they suggest that it's it's just a single root system that they found that looks like some kind of lycopsid, which is a group of very early vascular plants, like the famous stigmaria. But the most exciting one is the third type of tree, which is the group of trees that includes Archaeopteris, Ooh. which got a shout out in episode 73 as being one of the earliest known trees. Similar, uh, they describe to conifers, so your pine type things, it would have had a woody trunk, it would have had flat green leaves, so it would have looked like a tree. Not a tree like we know it today, but a tree, a recognizable tree. Yeah, it would it would have fit the the outline that you expect. Yeah, you wouldn't give it a double take if you walk past it in the forest. <laughs> it is known from the site from an extensive root system that the authors describe in the paper as spectacular. Just this complex network of fossilized roots. In some places, the root system is more than eleven meters across. Wow. So like 35, 40 feet. Jeez, that's that's quite the root system. Which is very impressive, and also they describe surprisingly modern. That trees have root systems like that today. They're complex, they're branching in all directions, and they last a long time. They are long-lived root systems. As opposed to the root systems of earlier plants, like the others that are found here in the same site, which tend to have root systems that are simpler, they're not branching as much, if at all, 
and they're shorter lived. They, they regrow on a regular basis. So this type of plant appears to have been a pioneer of the modern, more stable, more long-lasting root system, which suggests that Archaeopteris-style plants may have been really important features of early forests. That they were sort of the ones laying the groundwork, so to speak, nah. for the success of early forests. Yeah, setting that trend. The ones that sort of hit upon that technique that has worked for 385 million years since. Cool. I always love when we find features that... the. the the phrase surprisingly modern yep. features that have the, <laughs> that phrase with it. I'm always happy to see, especially with particularly old things. Because on one hand, it means we may have been interpreting the history of a group incorrectly. What we thought was a more ancestral trait or what we thought was a more derived trait turns out to be more ancestral than we thought. Right. It's easy to assume that a trait we see in the world today showed up recently. Yeah. And, you know, that it was something that took some time to develop because it's so complex. But it's also such a great reminder that how complicated things can be, even when you go back to the earliest days of, in this case, an ecosystem. Yeah. That's very cool. I also find something so poetically delightful in that these trees were developing their complex root systems at the same time, if you remember our last episode, that the earliest tetrapods were developing lakes. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. It was a busy time for the Earth. For those of you that like to picture things, uh, I think it was the press release that described the forest as it would have looked like an open forest with small to moderate conifer-like trees and then occasional tree fern-like plants amidst them. Cool. And that it probably was in this area of New York, but it was a forest, so it probably spread for um, unknown miles in all directions. Very neat. Well, my first bit of news is also about a potential first. Oh. Uh, or earliest, at least. This seems to be the currently oldest fossil of that shows evidence for parental care in amniotes. Oh. So, yeah. This is research by Hilary Madden et al. in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. And the article we'll be citing is from Catherine Wu in Smithsonian Mag. So these are fossils found in Nova Scotia uh, that are partial remains of, superficially, a lizard-like animal. Right. Early amniotes being essentially early reptiles. Yes. Very reptilian, uh, if not the reptiles we know today. Uh, these were fossils found in a stump that dates back to just over 300 million years old. Yeah. In in a slightly younger forest. Yes, exactly. <laughs> than what we just discussed. I know. When you were talking about that, I was like, oh, that's fitting. <laughs> now that there are stumps, uh, little reptiles can crawl up in them. So the fossils found here uh, were kind of found in two steps. The first were some backbones, some vertebrae, surrounded by some ribs, with some belly scales that led to a pelvis and femur. So hips and thigh bone. A good chunk of a reptile. Decent amount. Enough to identify a new species. So this is the first known remains of Dendromaya unamachiensis, which were early land-dwelling vertebrates, as we said, early tetrapods, uh, land-living tetrapods, about a foot long and would have resembled a monitor lizard. Okay. You know, ish. The characteristics of this specimen uh, are close to those of those in a group known as Varanopids, which are one of these extinct families of pre-mammalian ancestors that would have had many reptilian features to them. Okay, episode 47. Yes. This, though, was distinct enough to get its own genera. Its genus name, Dendromaya, is Mother in the Tree. Oh, that's cute. That name is because of the second fossil they found, which was a tiny inch-long skull that was nestled in the space where a left femur met the pubic bone. Oh. And what it seems to be is a juvenile specimen that was nestled between the leg and tail of the larger specimen. Huh. Which has been interpreted as very likely a parent and offspring that were nestled in the stump together. Well, that's pretty cool. So that's pretty exciting. They said it looks very much like 
dinning behavior. And if this is the case, it would suggest parental care in amniotes dates back 306 million years. Wow. Which is significant because it means that the origins of some form of parental care would be deeply rooted in the amniote tree of life, especially since the next oldest is 260 million years old (laughs) from the Permian, which was Heliosaurus, a specimen found with its tail curled around four juveniles. Ah. Which would make this currently the oldest amniote that shows potential parental care. And the other one also is a Varanopid. Is also a Varanopid, which means that this lineage specifically seems to share this feature going back into their, their evolutionary history. That's pretty cool. It's like what you were saying about the trees, that it's easy to assume things that are successful today are recent, especially since mammals and birds are the famous parental care providers in Mm -hmm. the animal world today, the two of which are, in the grand scheme of things, relatively recent groups of animals on the planet Earth. But now it makes perfect sense that parental care is something that either started way early on and has been taken... Taken or leaved <laughs> here and there along the evolutionary pathway, or has popped up a bunch of different mm-hmm. times. It's a pri- I mean, the benefits of that strategy are many. Yes. Well, and it's, uh, I like discoveries like this that suggest parental care was more common than we might suspect, especially since for a long time it was a, a battle to get people to even consider it in things like dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. Because it was assumed that. Only us advanced mammals could be kind and gentle and everything else just was brutal survival, you know, from day one. And even in the modern world, Mm -hmm. people were, it took a long time to get the scientific community, like the people in the mindset to accept the fact that, yeah, no, there are lizards and snakes Mm -hmm. that exhibit parental care. Alligators and crocs very famously exhibit parental care, but there's this long-standing stigma that we tend to say, nope, mammals and birds do it, and that's it. So this is a neat find and an intriguing find, but I, I'm not super surprised yeah. to find evidence of I'm surprised to find evidence of it because et, that kind of evidence is rare in the fossil record. I'm not surprised that animals were that doing it was happening. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, and they do mention that the the preservation is really nice here. They say exquisite in the article. And suggest that they died very suddenly. And what the cause was is unsure, but it could very well have been uh, something like a flooding event that while these two hid in the stump were then flooded by sediment and suffocated. Yeah. So that it was a instant burial and death sort of situation. But there are those who caution that this does not guarantee parental care. If they were hiding in the stump... These could be unrelated individuals that found the same port in the same storm. Right. You know, that just happened to find the same hiding space. The fact that it seems to be nestled into the other one could just mean that there wasn't much space. So it's not guaranteed, but the researchers are standing their ground that the the best answer from their point of view right now is that it does look like a parent and child. It's one of those that it's definitely not a sure thing, but the fact that there is another... Varanopid example of parental care that is similar to this does seem to lend some support. So yeah. I'll be interested to see what else comes out of these deposits. Absolutely. Well, my first bit of news was about trees, which is was fun because that's a group of life in the fossil record that doesn't get a whole lot of attention. So I'm happy to be able to bring some attention to a lesser discussed realm of, of, of paleontology. And I feel like it balances out a little bit the fact that my second bit of news is about T-Rex. There you go. Specifically, how juvenile T-Rex grew. And whether or not they were juvenile T-Rex after all. (gasps) Bum, bum, bum. Oh, boy, controversy. Intrigue. This is research by Holly Woodward et al. in Science Advances. And we'll link to an article in National Geographic by Michael Greshko. So, we have discussed on this episode before how we research how animals from the past grew and developed, episode 33, ontogeny, which is the word that describes that process, developmental change. Two studies in 2004 
looked at Tyrannosaurus Rex. Because if you're going to look at a dinosaur, that's the one you look at. (laughs) And they found really intriguing growth signatures. They found that T-Rex grows, compared to even other Tyrannosaurs, particularly fast. Yeah. What what is effectively a teenage growth spurt, where they are putting on what appears to be multiple pounds per year. Just like, because you're going from the size of a chick to the size of a house. Yeah. Well, an elephant. A small, <laughs> a small a very house. small house. A, a small house. I've, I've been in apartments <laughs> that I would say are smaller than T-Rex. Reaching adult size by about 20 years. So a, a growth rate that's surprisingly similar to humans. However, these kinds of studies have been based on fully grown T-Rex remains. And that can, you look at bone histology and you see what signs of growth have been left in the bone, which is cool, but there's some information you can't get from adult bones that you can get from younger animal bones. Because as bones are growing, they're also remodeling and reshaping themselves, which means you lose some information along the way. Yeah, your your skeleton is only ever so old because new bone has replaced the old. So in this study, the researchers sought out to look at juvenile tyrannosaurs to see, okay, what do the bones look like in animals that weren't fully grown? So they looked at two specimens. They looked at the tibia and the fibula, which are the lower leg bones, and histology, right? A histological analysis, you cut a super thin chunk, uh, like slice out of the bone, lay it on a microscope and see the evidence of bone growth. Like a projector slide. Both specimens are just a little bit more than half, so, so the estimated full length of the body a little bit more than half the length of a full-grown tyrannosaur like Sue, one of which is famously complete. So complete that it has a name. It's called Jane. (laughs) And if you recognize the name Jane, you might recognize it because of the other thing that's very interesting about these specimens is that they have both been among the fossils identified as a dinosaur called Nanotyrannus. This is the controversy part. So for the last, I think, few decades... There have been a handful of fossils that some researchers have pointed at and said these look like fully grown tyrannosaurs that were basically half size. Yeah. This is a pygmy tyrannosaur, or at least a tyrannosaur that's small. The fossils are found in the same places at the same time period as Tyrannosaurus rex. And so the controversy has been, are these actually mini tyrannosaurs you know only 20 feet long or are these just young tyrannosaurus rex that has been misidentified as something totally different there has been a lot of argument back and forth it seems like there's a lot of evidence sort of stacking up that points at nano tyrannus not actually being its own type of dinosaur yeah. but mistaken juvenile t-rex So the two fossils that are studied in this uh, piece of research also mean that these researchers can assess, all right, are these fully grown? Yes. Or are they indeed juvenile? And here's what they found. First, they found that the tissues of these leg bones are all disorganized, full of abundant blood vessels, which are signs of bone that's still growing. Mm-hmm. Right before it's sort of stabilized into a more uh, final form, bl- bl- uh, bone tissue is a, a, a mess of constant change. Well, because it's active, it's got all that blood flowing and tissue growing, which suggests that these were still growing, that they were juveniles, and which the authors point out probably puts another brick on the stack of evidence against them being their own type of dinosaur, not a nano tyrannus. Small Tyrannosaur, but just a small T-Rex that was small because it didn't grow up yet. The other thing that they found while looking at these bones is they were able to investigate what are effectively growth rings. So kind of like the rings in a tree, bone grows year to year. And you can explore this to learn a few different things. One, for example, how old the dinosaur was. And from this, they were able to calculate that these two specimens were at least 13 and 15 years old. Oh. Which is cool to know. But even more exciting, that the rate of growth between the rings, right, from line to line, seems to have varied dramatically from year to year. Huh. 
that they weren't growing in a consistent pattern, that their growth was basically speeding up and slowing down over and over again, which they interpret as them basically modulating their growth in response to environmental conditions. Yeah, it's good years and bad years. If it's a rough year and there's not a lot of food, right? If all the herbivores went off to the valley of whatever they call it in the land before time, (laughs) and now the predators don't have a lot of food left, you can slow down your growth. Which is also a pretty cool thing to see evidence of these animals doing. Which leads to a couple of takeaways. Either this is actually Nanotyrannus, but we just don't have adult Nanotyrannus and these are juveniles, which these authors suggest is probably not the case, or these are young T-Rex. And if they are young T-Rex, then this indicates that as T-Rex was growing, they had this exceptional growth strategy where they were able to conserve energy by slowing down their growth during tough years and putting lots of energy towards growth in the years that were, you know, abundant in resources and stuff. Which not only, it might be a hint as to why this is the only big predator in their ecosystems, because they were growing in a particularly successful way, but might also contribute to how these animals were living differently at different stages of their lives. That here's a T-Rex that's only half of its adult length, it's only 13 years old, but in a rough year, it can just not grow very much and still function just fine as a 20 foot long predator. And then when times get better, it can grow up into a 40 foot long predator and live just fine at that size too. Doing what's called ontogenetic niche partitioning, which is you are living differently at different stages of your life. Something that alligators do today. Absolutely. Very, very effectively. That still works with large predators today. Alligators and crocs grow dependent on how good the year is and the temperatures and live very differently. A baby does not hunt the same things as an adult. And that's really cool to see that T-Rex was potentially doing the same thing. It's also interesting because if <laughs> you said the, the two options, either they're young T-Rex or they are nano Tyrannus that's still growing. And if they are still growing, then that that brings up the question to me of how nano would nano Tyrannus be? Right. <laughs> like how... Are they just going to get bigger? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's really cool. And I like this study because it's a, it's a good example to me of how, you know, we reach scientific consensus is not by everyone voting yay or nay on nano Tyrannus. Right. This is yet one more study that seems to lean the body of evidence further in one direction. Right. It is not a nail in a coffin, so to speak. You know, someone could absolutely find a nano tyrannus specimen that is 100% definitely distinct. Right. And that would that would be a pretty much a hole in one, you know, uh, for the nano tyrannus side. But right now this is yet one bit on that side the T- young T-Rex side of the scale. And I like that because that's how we answer these debates over time. Just all right, we'll just keep studying them, and eventually one side will have obviously more support than the other. Yeah, science is about consensus of data, not consensus of opinions. Yes. And in terms of the nano Tyrannus debate, this these authors, and I've seen a bunch of other comments from other scientists who are basically saying, yeah, this here is yet another piece of evidence. Nano Tyrannus probably isn't its own distinct genus, probably juvenile T Rex. One of the scientists quoted in the National Geographic article does, in fact, call it a nail in the coffin. Yeah. He he calls it another nail in the coffin, and maybe it's time to bury that coffin. (laughs) I think that's Steve Brusati who said it. It's something along those lines. But it's to give the full picture, there are still scientists out there who I'm sure are rooting for Mm Nanotyrannus and suggesting that this isn't quite over yet. So we, this is almost certainly not going to be the end of the nano Tyrannus debate. But for what it's worth, it does look like the evidence is piling up against nano Tyrannus. I mean, I'm, I'm fairly well convinced by... Yeah, I'm not a Tyrannosaur expert. No. But from what I've seen, it, it's I, not looking good for nano Tyrannus. Well, and, that's, I've, and this is really where, once again, that consensus of data comes in. I've yet to have a study pop up that makes me just go, okay, well, wait, you know, that's pretty darn convincing. 
you know, I, I, I have only ever had it the other way. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll, we'll keep an eye out and we'll see what more happens. I'm, we will almost certainly talk more about Nano Tyrannus in a future news. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Very cool. Well, my, our, our final bit of news, my last news, is about an equally awesome animal, I think. Longfish. Right. Long, long fish. Long fish. Yeah. <laughs> long fish. Long, long fish. Long, long fish. They are fairly long. Yeah. Uh, long fish, you know, right up there in fame with T-Rex. Are <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty cool. A pretty awesome group of fish. This is about a fairly old fossil of long fish, not the oldest per se, but in an area that they hadn't been found before. Okay. Which is interesting for a couple reasons. Now, this is research by Robert Guess. G-E-S-S, guess. And Alice Clement in Pier J. And we'll be linking to an article by en- Enrico de Lazaro in Sci News. So lungfish, a, a fairly well-known group of fish nowadays, are fish with functional lungs. Yeah. Famously, as we discussed last episode 77, close relatives of tetrapods. Exactly. So they are those lobe-finned, fleshy-finned fish. Uh... Nowadays, there are not many species. There are only six spread across uh, Australia, South America, and Africa. But back in their heyday, they were much more diverse. They, going back to the early Devonian, over 400 million years ago, is when we see the first lungfish. And by the end of the Devonian, or late Devonian, they had diversified into over 100 species, or into close to 100 species. Wow. And more uh, more than a quarter of that originated in eastern Gondwana, so Australia. Okay. <laughs> while others were known from places like China and Morocco, uh, tropical and subtropical regions. This newly discovered species, is it Yumzi Melomombde, was instead found in South Africa, which would have been western Gondwana. Oh. From the late Devonian which means at the time it was alive, the landmass of South Africa it would have been living on, the freshwater habitats, would have been at about 70 degrees south latitude. Wow. Putting it in a polar environment near the South Pole. So not only distant from where most of the lungfish were at the time, but where it was cold and southern. Yeah. So an unusual spot, the first one from this region, fossil from this region found of a lungfish, uh, to make sure, no, from the late Devonian, and seems to have been living in an environment that we didn't, wouldn't expect to find lungfish from this time. Interesting. Now, this being said, it probably was not a particularly cold environment compared to today at this time. Uh, the other fossils they find in the, the deposits support this, that it would have been warmer than the south pole is today but that doesn't mean it wasn't you know tropical or that it was tropical but it was not probably frozen over it wasn't icy but they would have been experiencing the long periods of day and night throughout the year which means it's an environment that we don't see lungfish in now and so we don't know exactly how it would be surviving which is which is intriguing because it means this lungfish was doing something we didn't expect, nor do we know how lungfish respond or handle it. That's cool. So there is a term, and I'm sure we've used this before, that paleontologists go with that, that, that is called a range extension. Yes. Which is you find a fossil in a, of a particular group of animals in a place you've never seen them before. So on the map of where they are found, you've extended their range. Uh, this would be a geographical range extension, an extension in space. Mm-hmm. As opposed to in time, right? An earlier or later find. But this is also an ecological extension. Yeah, it is. They, we have found them in a different environment, a different habitat than we've expected to see them before. And it's always fun to discover a fossil that tells us that a particular group of organisms was more diverse and more capable than we thought. Yeah, it's really interesting. And it's a cool fossil uh, they said that the fossil included tooth plate scales and some cranial material. So, Ooh, so like a nice fossil. So it's a nice fossil. So yeah, I, like we said earlier in the news, look forward to hopefully seeing more from this deposit. Let's find lots of lungfish. Yeah, more trees, more lungfish, 
more whatever the other thing you talked about was <laughs> more parents more parents <laughs> and then more or less <laughs> nana <Tyrannus. laughs> and that's gonna wrap up the news all right so now We'll wrap up and we can get ready for our discussion of the fascinating term, exaptation. So when it comes to evolutionary theory, there are many different aspects of what makes it run so to speak (laughs) of the different processes and uh, features that can cause an organism to evolve the way it does we've discussed a few of these by no means have we covered all of them we did the uh, evolution of evolutionary theory yep episode 56 we did sexual selection episode 63 and we did uh convergent evolution 70 so we've discussed some of the aspects uh but there are many And there are, even with as many different terms, there are still gaps. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a complex subject. Yeah, and so there are areas where the terms we have don't always seem to fully fit exactly what's being discussed. That's what the term exaptation was attempting to to resolve, was one of these gaps in our terminology and our ability to describe evolution. So, exaptations are when a feature in an organism, plant, animal, microbe, whatever it is, a feature in that organism evolved for one purpose or currently serving no survival purpose is co-opted for a different solution to survival. Now, co-opted meaning that it is basically they are stealing that feature. Different purpose different survival trait from what it originally was. So a great example, probably the most famous example you'll always see used are feathers. Right. So feathers on birds help them to fly and protect them and keep them insulated. But the earliest feathers we see are on dinosaurs that definitely weren't flying. Right. We talked about this way back in episode 37, that you have feathers for either for protection Mm -hmm. or for keeping warm or for display and then eventually natural selection went hey this is handy this is catching this is creating airfoils really really well maybe glide with it a bit (laughs) and this this is always the prime example of acceptation the feathers were initially evolved natural selection was selecting them for protection and insulation and display potentially not for flight. That was not their purpose whatsoever for the fact that the early dinosaurs we see them with seem to have no gliding or flying abilities. Right. Once the feathers became big and broad enough to catch the air, that then became a viable function. They were exapted for flight. Doesn't mean we're eliminating the purpose of insulation, display, and protection, but... The other features of the feathers, the fact that they catch the air, the fact that they can create an airfoil, were exapted to a new purpose of flight. Right. If you build a tool for a specific purpose and then hand it to a child, yes, they will exapt it to do something totally different with it. It is now a toy. <laughs> and that was the biggest complaint of my parents growing up. They used to bemoan why they ever bought me toys because they find me in the kitchen playing with tongs yep those pots and pans were not meant to be percussion instruments (laughs) and yet this is what you've done and so that's really the idea here it doesn't mean it the potter pan has stopped being a potter pan Mm -hmm. but it's now also a drum and so exaptation is this reuse of secondary features or currently unused features Now, to explain the more in-depth concepts of this term, we need to go into the history of a bit. What the purpose of this term was meant to be. Sure. It's a history episode. It is. You didn't think so, but it is. We got you. This is actually a very young term. Uh, It only goes back to 1982. Okay, that's barely longer than we go back. Yeah, exactly. So this is just slightly older than the two of us, and it was proposed by Stephen Jay Gould and Elizabeth Verba. The purpose for this trait 
they proposed in their paper was to fill in the description, fill in a term for the description of this reusing of traits. Up to that point, they had a term that was used called pre-adaptation, which was saying that something was, you know, feathers were pre-adapted to flight. And a lot of people didn't like that term. I'm not sure I like that term. Because it kind of suggests that there was a goal. Right, foresight. That there was foresight, what they call a teleological, looking at the current use, not how it got there. Right. Pre-adapted makes it sense. It's like preheating. Exactly. Like we were getting ready to fly. Exactly. But you weren't. You didn't know that flight was on the horizon. It's. It seems to enforce that mentality that flight was inevitable. Right. The destiny. That, well, yeah, we were going to fly because they're flying now. Right. And that's, once again, taking into consideration what you know, not what happened. And that's what they really wanted to encourage scientists to avoid. They were... Uh, they point out that too often it is easy to look at a trait as it is nowadays or as it is in the fossil animal you're looking at and say, well, this mole was made for digging. So obviously, over time, it adapted to dig. And they argue that, yes, but maybe not. Any one of those features could have potentially had a previous use that is no longer being displayed because it got accepted. It got redefined, redirected to a different purpose that now is the feature we see. And by assuming that everything is pure natural selection adaptation, always heading toward the current form, we may be overlooking other solutions to how things came to be the way they are. Yeah, it's interesting how early preconceptions or misconceptions about certain processes get caught in our language. And we even do, I mean, you and I do it all the time. We'll talk about this feature was adapted to help with blah, blah, blah. Or, or they, was, they evolved this to you know, do this. Uh, kangaroos are designed for jumping is a designed right, right, is right. a phrase that's really easy to accidentally slip in. Birds evolved feathers to assist with mm-hmm. flight, but they didn't, it didn't evolve to a purpose. Exactly. Something was there and was selected for over time. And it's not a, a, at all a coincidence, I think, that one of the names on that list, Stephen Jay Gould, who proposed it, was a big science communicator, big voice in trying to get the public to think about evolutionary processes from a natural selection point of view, as opposed to a predetermined yes. or a design or a some you know something with foresight like was is a lingering mentality. Yes, and that's what acceptation is a term was in a big part meant to do was reshape our thinking or at least as a reminder to encourage you to remember maybe something weird happened and the feature you're looking at wasn't always meant to do the thing it's now doing but happened to be good for it and so exaptation is meant to remind us of that aspect of evolution it is meant to replace pre-adaptation that was okay very much the goal Get rid of that term, which has misleading suggestions, and replace it with this new term that is describing a an event, not a, a previous condition. Now, specifically, they say that exaptations are using features that are secondary to an adaptation. So adaptations being, I am something that swims, and the I have these adaptations to be better at swimming, that have these side features that aren't really important, but they're just kind of side effects. So it's either using one of those side effects of an adaptation, or it's using something people will sometimes call a non-adaptation. Okay. An adaptation that was useful and has since stopped to be useful because of the way an organism has uh, changed its survival strategy. Wisdom teeth in humans would be one of those well, you know, the vestigial structures would also be a good example of non-adaptations where you have this because it once was important and now it's not important. Those are also very open for exaptation because you have it still. And all of a sudden, something might come up where that's now useful for a random different purpose than its original one. And now it can be exapted 
for that uh, new way to survive. So those are your typical two categories. The other reason they really wanted to promote this term is because it goes very much along with things that Darwin suggested in Origin of the Species, or at least in his final edition of it. Uh, there's a quote from Darwin where he says, The highly important fact that an organ originally constructed for one purpose may be converted into one for a widely different purpose. So he had talked about this happening, but did not ever give a term to it. You know, natural selection is the pushing for, you know, improvement of your survival strategy. This is a kind of side idea to that, that he never defined. So they were wanting to kind of fill in and remind people that this has been there since the beginning. We've ha always had this idea, but because it didn't have a term, it's easily overlooked. You know, when you don't have terminology to use, it's very easy to forget to consider it. So that was really the point of creating this term, historically. So, the big question, where does this leave adaptation? That's kind of the big How question. Is this what's the difference? Exactly. Where's the line? Where? What's different? What's similar? And this is meant to be more conceptually a counterpart to adaptation, not a replacement in any way. It's replacing pre-adaptation very actively, but adaptations are still happening. And adaptation is normal, natural, quote-unquote normal. Right. Natural selection. You know, I am a animal that eats leaves that are higher than the other animals. And over time, natural selection selects for longer necks. Right. It favors. You are more likely to survive if you have this feature that helps you get food. Thus, you pass it on to more offspring. Exactly. Thus the trait persists. So that's the norm. And those are adaptations. You are adapting further and further for whatever survival strategy it is you're trying to survive with. Longer necks, better teeth, better running legs, fur for surviving in the cold, etc. And exaptation is not driven by natural selection. It is not something that you are currently being selected for. It is a secondary feature that turns out randomly to be useful for a different purpose. So it's kind of a sudden fork in the road, so to speak of an adapted feature, or non-adapted feature, you know, of a previously adapted feature that goes in a different direction and then can be naturally selected for now that this new feature is present. Right. You evolved feathers. Mm -hmm. They were selected because they helped you keep warm or whatever. And now they're there. And s surprise, surprise, that has affected the way your body works in a way that is unrelated to the original trajectory, right? You catch the air currents. Yes. You jumped out off of a branch and you were going kind of slower, completely unrelated to insulation or display. And if that is now a significant impact on your survival strategy, natural selection takes over in a totally different direction. And so the they proposed that many of the complex features we see in nature are probably a mixture of adaptations and acceptations and adaptations and acceptations. Right. Where you have adapted feathers as a solution to insulation and protection. And then they are accepted for flight, which then are further adapted for flight, right. which can then be accepted again for crazy birds of paradise, you know, noise making or and so on and so on. I guess an example, because you mentioned the, the idea of a vestigial structure then mm -hmm. being exapted, and uh, an example that comes to mind, surprise, surprise, in snakes, <laughs> is that snakes lost their limbs. Yes. Which is a case of, we don't need this, let's get it out of the way. Again, I'm using terminology that provides this yes, idea of foresight. Natural selection is favoring a slender, legless body, so legs yep. are being adapted away. And... A handful of snakes, one or two groups of snakes, before the legs fully disappeared, hit upon this survival strategy of using the little nubs left over for scraping at each other in territorial combat. Mm -hmm. These are the spurs that boas and pythons have. So now that is a feature that natural selection can go, oh, hang on a second. Before those disappear, now there's a selective pressure to adjust the shape or the size because now it's important for reproductive processes. Now you're fighting a rival or whatever you're doing. Absolutely. Now, 
for the fact that this is a young term, this probably isn't surprising. And some of you may already be arching eyebrows at mm-hmm. some of the definitions we've given, <laughs> and you're not alone. Not everyone is super happy with this term, and that's putting it very lightly. <laughs> <laughs> this, weird, this is an episode full of controversy. This is this term is actively being debated, attacked and defended, and is not a, not violently controversial, but is a term that there are some who are actively trying to find support for, and others are actively asking people to stop using. You'll if you throw this word into a room of of evolutionary biologists, yes. you'll see some smiles and some beleaguered sighs. Yes. Like, and we're going to discuss that in more detail later on though first let's look at what exactly this term is supposed to be representing some examples and how it is currently showing up in science so we talked about the most famous example feathers are if you look up an article about acceptation and it doesn't mention feathers (laughs) you are in a weird part of the internet because every (laughs) single one i found (laughs) mentioned feathers It's a good example. It is the example that people go to. But there are others, some weirder ones that I found particularly interesting and wanted to pull aside. Probably one of the ones that was a cool, weird example that I never would have thought of are mammalian sutures in their skulls. So the sutures in your skulls are the points between the individual bones that are used, that have been exapted for live birth. Oh, I see. What yeah. You're getting at. So sutures in the skull are n- not unusual. Most animals with bony skulls have sutures between them where the bones meet and either are or aren't fused. Right. Because as an embryo, the different bones are growing independently. Yes. And so as your skull develops, those bones fuse together into the full dome. Yeah, the, 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 the skull shape. Now, With many other, like if you look at other mammal skulls, you know, or other, if you look at other reptile skulls, the sutures are all there and they're used to make the skull flexible for eating and stuff like that. But in mammal skulls, and this is especially notable in us humans because we've got a big old skull, the sutures when we're born are not fully fused. And this is not because we're not done cooking, so to speak. It is because our head's too big to be born fused. It would get stuck. So by having unfused sutures, we can squeeze out of the birth canal. And this has been pointed out as a potential example where those sutures that were already present for other purposes have been exapted for live birth in mammals. So the, the, the original purpose being, and either the purpose of holding bones together, or as just a happenstance yes. side effect of the way the skull grows. That, that a suture arguably might not have a specific purpose. Yeah, it wasn't an adaptation. It just, well, we had to make a skull out of something, and we have all these bones, so skull. So it's a feature that ended up there that you can now modify and adapt for something else. And is now crucial to human survival, at least. So that's that's a little weirder example that I thought was really cool. Another one that connects back to our last episode are tetrapod limbs. Yep. Tetrapod limbs are a famous example of exaptation. Not so much the fact that we use them for walking. That's an adaptation for living on land. But the fact that we have four and that we used those four limbs to start walking on land, that is a result of the fin arrangement of fish and the musculature and everything, as we discussed in our early tetrapods episode, In the transition episode, fish were not using those limbs to just initially walk on land. They were using them quite well while still being in the water. Using them for terrestrial movement was an exaptation of those movements and those new musculatures and uh, that four-limb arrangement. Another one that you could argue with the tetrapods, and I don't have a list in front of me. Yes. All of these. So, yeah, you could argue with me, as (laughs) some people absolutely would. Uh, We talked about how... As tetrapods developed, the shoulder girdle detached from the skull Mm -hmm. as part of freeing up the limb girdle. So it is a good adaptation to have your shoulders separate from the skull so that they can develop 
you know, they have more space for muscle attachment. They're not anchored to the back of the skull, which happens to leave behind a neck. A neck that now can be used for mobility and, and all that sorts of stuff. is free to be adapted for different purposes. And so, yeah, those kinds of things. Uh, and, and I'm sure that many transitions would be rife with potential oh, yeah. acceptations that you could point out. Because that's kind of what's going on is the body parts are changing from or you know organisms are changing from one way of life to another and at this point in the episode it it becomes very quickly apparent that this isn't a description of some like special rare thing that there's a couple examples of this is part and parcel of evolution yeah so, so, sort of business as usual in evolution yeah there are there are many who have pointed out that if the interpretation of acceptation is an accurate one for a, a viable term it is about as frequent as normal adaptations are. Yeah. And that, as they said, every complex feature you look at is probably a mixture of the two. In some way or another, mm -hmm. there's something... The trajectory of natural selection has changed over time. Absolutely. Another fun one, which we mentioned in our Turtles episode... Ooh, episode 60. Is that turtle shells were not, as far as we can tell, initially meant for defense. Ah, uh, yeah. They were to support... To be a support platform for strong digging and strong limbs. Potentially. Potentially. Yeah. <laughs> As we discussed in exactly in the episode. And so that this is turtles, so... Uh. Yeah. But they almost surely, from what we can tell, were not defensive in their right, original right. purpose. But now that's one of their main features. Yeah. Here's another snake one. Teeth are for biting, but in vipers yeah. and other snakes, they have co-opted the tooth shape into a needle. Well, and another, another one I thought of for snakes was uh, constriction, is you did not get long and skinny, most likely to constrict things. Right. But once you're a rope, uh, <laughs> constricting is a real handy way to kill stuff. And now natural selection will push for, push will select yeah. for stronger muscles. For anacondas. Better, for anacondas. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you said... The examples go on and on, and there are even more subtle, you know, more uh, 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 more scaled down examples, as in internal ones. Like, there are genetic examples, and human neuroscience has been one field that has grabbed onto the term exaptation in a few ways. For example, according to our current understanding, the human brain has basically been the human brain for the last 150,000 years. Okay. You know give or take, I'm sure. And there hasn't been, as far as we can tell, significant physical change in our neurology. But there has been significant change in what we're doing with it. In that time, we see the creation of complex language and writing and reading and mathematics. I see where you're going with this. And they're saying that if our brain was the way it was before those things and is still the way it was, it is after, then the features we used to create those complex things were already there and weren't there for reading and writing and math because those didn't exist yet. Right, right. So the neurology has been exapted to these new complex behaviors that we've created, these these uh, cognitive processes. That's a cool way to think about it. So this term is flexible. You know, it doesn't just refer to feathers in flight. It, it refers to any time... You were using something for one purpose, and then a random second purpose showed up. Now, those are all very popular, and and some of those are the, the famous examples that are often used to you know, uh, explain when initially defining this term. But, and you may have noticed, most of those are what seems to have happened. We haven't actually directly done a study to confirm Right. This seems to support this notion. According to our understanding, it sure does seem that this is what happened. But they aren't actually studies, which is which is one of the interesting parts of exaptation because it's dealing with historical forms and purposes versus current forms and purpose. Sometimes you can't directly observe. Right. We got to we got to find a way to science it. Yeah. So after the break, we'll take a look at some of the papers that have actually attempted to bring some actual data. 
okay. to this term and how they've done that and what they've turned up. Interesting. I'm excited for it. If there's some really interesting ones. <laughs> So when it comes to studying exaptation, you have to come at it from a different direction because as we said, you can't actually go back and confirm that the earliest feathered dinosaurs were not using the feathers in some sort of aerodynamic way. You can't necessarily observe the evolutionary processes that happened. Right. It's very difficult. It's, it, it, I mean, in living things even, yes. but especially in the fossil record to nail down exactly what selective pressures were impacting the evolution of a particular feature. Yes. And so this adds a, a wrench to the whole process of trying to confirm or deny that exaptation is a reliable or valid term. So many of the studies you'll find are collections of research. They have gone through and they've looked for trends in bodies of evidence to see how many times there appear to be solid evidence and support for that an exaptation happened. And there's been some cool, weird ones. Probably uh, the most common of these for like modern things uh, that we can observe the side effects of are viruses. Ooh, yeah, that makes sense. And we mentioned this in our uh, one of our patron questions uh, where they asked if beneficial things could ever be left oh, behind yes, yes, yes. by virus DNA being injected into a cell. That's right. Endogenous retroviruses. And this is one of the, you know, most common, it's argued, cases of exaptation in that we are reusing genetic material for our own purposes. Right. So the way that endogenous retroviruses work, in brief, is that a virus gets into your genome for whatever reason gets stuck there, right? The DNA of the virus is now part of the genome. It doesn't get activated. It doesn't start doing its virus thing and kill the cell or anything. It's stuck in the genome. And if it does that in a sex cell mm -hmm. and gets passed down, now it is just a heritable part, a little extra chunk of DNA, which now that it's part of your genome, natural selection can act upon. Mm -hmm. And if that genetic code produces a particular protein or something, natural selection... Oh, hey, now that you're producing this protein, there's this benefit, so let's select upon that. You've unlocked this skill tree. And that is a huge portion of evolution. You know, in, in us genetic organisms targeted by viruses, which is basically... All of them. Yep. You know, bacteria have viruses that aim for them. Plants have viruses that aim for them. Us animals have viruses that aim for us. And one article I found counted that there's roughly 100,000 pieces of viral DNA in, in the human genome. Oh, yeah. Well, and when we were answering that question, I had a, a statistic, and I don't remember what it was, but it some surprisingly high percentage of the human genome is thought to be derived from viruses. The one I found said 8%. That Eight, sounds 8 about right. 8% percent of our genes. So almost a tenth. Whew. Almost one tenth of our <laughs> genome is thought to be viral, which is significant. That's a lot of genetic material for us to work with, for our evolutionary history to have worked with. Uh, we do see examples. Uh, there's the, the hemoprotein that's found in pregnant women. Yes. That they did not know what the purpose or source was and found that it is viral in origin. And uh goes back to over 100 million years ago, at least, that it must have ended up in our ancestral DNA. Wow. And so, like, there are features that are integral to human, you know, survivability. Uh, there are bacterial examples, many bacteria that are targeted by uh, bacteria phages, which are viruses that attack them have prophages in their genome that are very similar to the proteins and DNA of the viruses attacking them and protect against viral attack. Now, is this the origin that has been debated and is hard to confirm, but it could very likely be that over the 
millions of years of viruses attacking bacteria, some bacteria incorporated some of that viral information and used it as a defense. Well, I remember uh, there there's evidence of that in some animals, and I think in humans as well, of viral DNA having the benefit of producing some sort of protein that acts as a defense against other pathogens, mm-hmm. other diseases. And now that it's stuck in our bodies, oh, we can produce this defensive protein that wards off this particular bacteria. And so now even if uh, the action the gene is doing is very similar to what it was doing for the virus, the purpose was not to protect us from viruses. Right. The the purpose (laughs) was to infect people for whatever reason it was helping the virus do that. That was the intended adaptation of that genetic material. Now it's been exapted because it got stuck in us for purposes that usually benefit us. There are plenty of bad side effects of getting virus stuff stuck in you, but (laughs) the ones that have persisted are examples of this genetic exaptation. A weird example I found, which is this one was just unexpected, is fish sound production. So fish are actually very noisy. Uh, If any of you have ever watched a documentary like Blue Planet, there is almost always a section nowadays in these documentaries where they turn on the mic just to show you how noisy a coral reef is. Yep. And it sounds like all these clicks and and these echoey bumps, just weird noises that are fish and krill and shrimp and organisms clicking and chirping at each other underwater. Uh, You know, they're just as complex as anything on land is. Well, the way fish produce those sounds is typically uh, or very often at least side effects of other features in their anatomy okay and that's the point this this paper was making as pimentier et al from 2017 collected a whole bunch of examples to say that a lot of times the way they're making sound is related to something they would have already have been doing and it was probably a sound that was just being made when they did that thing And now it's used for social or territorial or communication reasons. Okay. So as just just natural breathing or swimming, something was rubbing against something or clicking against something and making a noise. Well, you know, it's if I scratch my beard and it goes scritch, 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 that's not the purpose of the beard. But down the line, scritch, scritch, scritching could be a signal. Get a get some stridulation there. Exactly. uh, Katie did has I could beard (laughs) stridulate with the other wills. And we could communicate. <laughs> so that's kind of the thing. They're, that's what they're proposing here. Uh, some examples, just to give you an idea of what sort of noises fish make and how they're making it and why it fits into this. Swim bladders are one tool used to make noise. Swim bladder is a gas pocket, a, a organ that holds air to control buoyancy in many, most fish. Right. Fish can selectively fill it or release gas from it to... Adjust their buoyancy so that they can more easily rise or fall. Yeah, so they can float at different depths. Vibrating that, as you would get from most bags of air, creates noise. And so, like a balloon. Like a balloon. (laughs) Yeah, or like thumping a balloon. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's they can make those thumbing sounds by vibrating the gas bladder. You have a you have a drum inside of you. Yes, exactly. And. The muscles they need to do that are usually fairly fast contracting muscles because slow vibrations don't make much noise or are silent. You need the fast vibrations. The origin of those muscles is unsure, but they seem to be similar or to be derived from muscles used for movement, for propulsion. Okay. And that now there are muscles specialized for vibrating the the air bladder. And in many fish, like a toadfish... It produces sound and still produces buoyancy, and they are suggesting that that was a side effect, that muscles would vibrate this bladder, creating noise, which then became useful. But probably the most common form is things, sound produced by feeding mechanisms, when the fish would be eating. This includes just opening and closing the mouth will create some noise in certain fish. A damselfish produce noise when they contract their mouth due to a ligament that's particular to them. Hmm. And the ligament seems to be very important in certain feeding behaviors like the algae grazers. So it's the ligament was probably for grazing on algae, 
a specific feeding mechanism that created noise that they now use to signal to one another. Interesting. Another example is pharyngeal jaws. Those okay. are the throat jaws that are so famous in like moray eels and stuff. Yeah. yeah, the second set of jaws hanging out in the throat that can move forward if you need them to. I.e. alien xenomorphs. Naturally. But other fish have pharyngeal jaws to help them maneuver food into the throat and to chew and things like that. Uh, grunts are a group of fish named for the noise they make hmm. by scraping the upper and lower teeth of the pharyngeal jaws together Gah. to stridulate in their throat. Huh. So they're, so they're swimming around, and in their throat there is this other set of jaws gnashing its teeth, <laughs> and you can hear it yep. outside of the fish. Boy, fish. But this sound is produced normally during feeding. So okay. even when they're not attempting, they will still make some of the noise while using the jaw normally. Uh, now they're able to produce the, so the sound actively. So here we have an example where we can observe a feature, a function of this trait that is a side effect. Yes. We can watch the fish. Oh, they're making noise while they eat. And also observe them making the same noise while not eating for an apparent communication purpose. Exactly. So we can we can see what appears to be both the before the intended purpose feature, the side effect, right? The before and after is yes. active in the same animal. Exactly. Cool. A gr another great example where that's the case is in uh, seahorses and pipefish. Which, when they feed, they use their whole skull moves because they have locked jaws. Okay. So they can't just open their mouth casually like other fish. They have to do this weird movement where the bones flex to open the mouth. And to eat, they have to do this kind of hiccup motion where they jerk their head. It flexes the head back. And two plates on the head collide and make a noise. Huh. And click. And when they normally feed, they it makes that clicking sound. Like, it just sounds like a little snap of the fingers. But they'll also use that sound for courtship and competition and territorial displays. And so, once again, you can see the sound when they're just normally feeding, which they have to do the head click for. But then they also use it in these non-feeding situations. Interesting. And then, probably the weirdest, unsurprisingly, are catfish. Yeah, <laughs> that'll do it. So catfish, um, m many, most catfish have pectoral spines. So around the front fins, they have these two spines that are just awful looking. They're serrated <laughs> like an daggers. Just shring. Yeah, except if they were serrated and hooked backwards <laughs> like a um, um, saw. So, yeah, just awful. I've heard they're one of the most painful things you could ever get stuck by wow from people who fish but they have those spines on either side of the body and then a reinforced pectoral girdle so the where the fins are attaching the front fins are attaching and they can lock those spines sideways and they use them as defensive mechanisms you know right. sharp spines but also now i'm all wide and pointy so i'm going to be hard to swallow and i can lock it against that pectoral girdle but some catfish can use the top of the spine to stridulate, to rub it against another uh, part of their body and make noise, which, once again, does not seem to be why they had spines to begin with, because those are very dangerous musical instruments, if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, noisy fish were just a, a plethora of examples. You're just using all sorts of stuff all over the body. For sounds that they probably were making... By accident. Right, right. You know, that that doing that thing just made a noise, and some groups utilize that noise. But our best study is yet to come. This study actually did attempt to do a full analysis on the concept of exaptation. Now, they could not watch an organism evolve in real time, so they simulated it. Okay. Uh, or at least they couldn't do that yet. Maybe in the future. This study by Andreas Wagner and Aditya Barv from 2013 used computer models to analyze metabolism networks. Okay. So what I mean by a metabolism network is different metabolism networks are going to be uh, uh, sh 
are going to be constructed in different ways to metabolize, to use different proteins as fuel sources. You know, so while you know, we can use things like glucose, which is sugar from plants, other organisms are using different proteins, okay. different so a, molecules. A network of metabolic Steps, processes yeah. that are built around the particular kind of food you have to metabolize. Exactly. So they made computer models of these to then see if they'd be able to metabolize unrelated food sources. And to see if there are features built into metabolisms that couldn't utilize a secondary food source that doesn't have anything to do with your initial food source. Hmm. Now, once again, they, it, there's no easy way for them to actually do this. So the computer models they used are based off of E. coli bacteria. And they then switched out portions of the network with other known metabolic networks with other known sections and evolved in quotes the network by randomly making these swaps the caveat being that they still had to be able to metabolize glucose right. so glucose was their starting molecule every network they created had to still be able to metabolize that but it had been created randomly and by restricting the, the networks to only those that worked with glucose, they were effectively simulating natural selection and weeding out the ineffective networks. Right. If you change to the point that you can't eat anymore, that you can't keep that. Yeah. You die. You die. You do not reproduce. Yes. You do not pass go. So by doing this, they created 500 new metabolic networks. Okay. All of which can metabolize glucose. That was the only caveat. You need to be able to eat plant sugar and the process to create you was random i think they said each one had a few thousand swaps that created them fully randomized then they evaluated whether or not this network could metabolize a a selection of 49 other fuel source molecules right. can this food processor take this other thing yes and what they found is, most of the time, yes. Hmm. 96% of the networks could metabolize other carbon sources, other food sources. And most of the time, on average, they could use almost five of them. Huh. So, huge amounts of these networks, of the 500 networks they created, could survive on other foods. And typically more than one of them. Uh, this machine is built to shred paper, but it can also shred other stuff. Exactly. <laughs> they then repeated it and did the same network creation, but starting with each of the 49 other carbon sources. Okay. So that now they're starting from the other side and then testing it across and found basically the same numbers in the results. The majority of the networks were able to metabolize other carbon food sources and it wasn't dependent on it being similar to their original. Like, if you were metabolizing glucose, the other sources did not need to be something made out of glucose. Right. That wasn't a trend they saw. What they saw was the more successful, as far as metabolizing multiple sources, uh, networks were the ones that were more complex. The more complexity the network allowed for more versatility, evidently. Which suggests that if this model does hold up to real-world metabolisms, that complex systems are rife with potential exaptation opportunities. That you were not evolving to eat this food source. You were evolving to eat food source A. But you can eat food source B by accident, having nothing to do with your evolutionary history. But you can, which means... If it, food source A runs out, you can switch over to B, which now can suddenly redirect your evolution, and you would have an evolutionary history that was a mixture, that was not necessarily fully adapted for one versus the other. Very cool. Yeah. That's a very interesting finding. Now, of course, to confirm this, they need to use live test subjects. Right. So they should talk to, if they if this is not already part of the study... Go talk to Richard Lenski and friends with the long-term evolution yes. experiment. And so... Which I, I believe did find 
a branch of bacteria that adapted to eat a new food source. I think Although, so. if I remember correctly, it was something they were already eating a little bit. Yes. And it adapted to predominantly eat a new food source, which could be very similar to what mm-hmm. they found in their theoretical models here. So that's the next step. That's not an easy step. So there, the last notes in that paper were them saying, that's our next goal, and we're working on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in 20 years, when we have 30,000 generations of bacteria, yep. we can take a look. But if this computer model is uh, uh, to be taken seriously, that's a very promising support for X adaptation as a as a true evolutionary tool. Now, with that high note, the last thing we really have to discuss is why are there so many people that seem to not like this term? Yeah, what are the what are the problems? Yeah, we've we've done an episode almost now seeming <laughs> to just give you example after example. So why why are people having issue with this term? On the other hand, and the issue is not that they're claiming acceptation doesn't happen. It's the term. For most people, the biggest complaint is that it is an ill-defined term. In that it is a little too vague. Which, I wouldn't surprise me if there are people listening to this right now who have never <laughs> heard of this before going, Yeah! Yeah, who, thank yeah, you! <laughs> thanks, <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that, I was thinking that. <laughs> it, that it seems vague, or at least... It does not seem distinct enough to be its own term. Right. Now, what do they mean by that? There are a few specific complaints. First, a lot of people don't think it is separate enough from adaptation. By that, they mean that if an exaptation is supposed to be a feature that was selected for a secondary purpose from the initial purpose... Well, most adaptations, if you go far enough back in history, fall into that category. Yeah. That most things were not evolved for their initial, for their eventual purpose when they initially evolved. Which could mean that all adaptations are acceptations. Which is a fair argument. It's, you know, this term is almost too useful (laughs) right (laughs) you can apply it to everything it seems which they say it means it's redundant if all adaptations are exaptations then they're just adaptations yeah then we can just keep the original term and stop trying to use a new term which is valid other people just think it is uh a bit too murkily defined i've seen a few things that point out that the fact that exaptation and co-option are used synonymously and interchangeably is very confusing. Yeah. And makes it unclear of, are there times I should use one or the other? Or can I just use whichever one I want? Right. And if they both mean the same thing, then why do you need both? Yeah, then we don't need two. So that's another issue. Because science is just full of streamlined (laughs) terminology. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We're, We're real good at it. There are also those who argue that there's no easy way to, or at least practically, there is not an easy way to identify an exaptation, especially considering that typically most adaptations are not under a single selective pressure. They're under multiple selective pressures. You know, feathers, once again, were not just evolved because dinosaurs got cold. They also protect the skin. They also are display features which one of those was the initial selection were they all happening at the same time was one happening more and then the second one came in and overshadowed it a little bit and the third one came in and even it it's complex which means that though hypothetically you know in in a example situation exaptation is very clearly you're able to point it out practically the actual process is so complicated and blurred that you're not really able to confirm when was the acceptation or was that just a shift in selection pressures? Is there a distinction enough? Is there enough um, definition to actually be able to point out exaptive events? And then one that I found pretty interesting is there are people who claim pre-adaptation is a valid term (laughs) for specific situations that we should not get rid of it. The example that's often given is if an animal is living in 
environment A. And environment A is, you know, rare or just normally distributed. But then suddenly, in the future, becomes much more common. Well, those animals are pre-adapted to the new, widely spread ecosystem. The best example that always comes to my mind of this is that there have been some studies that have found that when the Ice Age kicked in, some of the creatures that became the most common were the ones that were living at high altitudes. Mm -hmm. That here are creatures that were adapted to living in cooler habitats high up on mountains, and then when the world got cooler and cool habitats became the norm down in the lowlands, those animals were able to spread. They were pre-adapted for Ice Age conditions because they lived in places that were cold before the Ice Age. And so in a situation like that, that's not suggesting that they were getting ready for the Ice Age. They were already ready for it when it randomly happened. Luck of the draw. Right. The next major climactic shift happened to shift in your favor. They were selected for that kind of environment. They, they were actually selected for that kind mm-hmm. of environment. And then that environment became widespread. They're using that adaptation the same reason they were using it before, just now with new opportunities. And so this one is less an attack on acceptation, but a defense of pre-adaptation. Right. And that it shouldn't be replaced by acceptation because... That feature is still just them surviving in cold, but it is now more beneficial than it was. So it is a complex dialogue going on, and there are people responding to these complaints. Uh, There are people who have come up to say, yes, basically any adaptation, if you take it back far enough, came from a previous form that likely had a different purpose. But to quote, that's not the point. The distinction is, was natural selection driving the changing in forms, or was it a side effect of features that had a benefit? They argue it is distinct, that adaptations are being driven by natural selection, exaptations are something that, a, a useful bit that was not being selected for, that then became, then, then became a, a bigger deal. So the the dialogue is still going. This is not saying, and we're ending the episode to tell you, ha it was all fake. <laughs> but there are a lot of people who don't like this term for a variety of reasons, some of which are very, very valid. Yeah, it sounds like uh, the, the use of exaptation oftentimes is relative. Mm-hmm. So the idea there being that, you know, feathers are derived from, you know, if feathers are derived from scales, then scales were serving a purpose and then mm-hmm. were exapted for this, and then feathers became a thing for something and then got exapted for flight, and then flight feathers were exapted for display features, but that the exaptation is relative to the situation you're talking about. Mm-hmm. If I'm specifically talking about the transition from fluffy body covering to flight feathers, then maybe it's useful to talk about exaptation. Similar to episode 10, we talked about a lot of taxonomic terms Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where you talk about ancestral features or basal features or derived features, and that those words are, it depends on what group you're talking about. If you're talking about mammals, then fur is a basal feature, an ancestral feature. But if you're talking about all tetrapods, then fur is a very specialized feature evolved only in the one branch that we call mammals. Exaptation may be very similar. Yeah, and and that's, it's kind of interesting because that seems to be an argument both for and against, depending on which Mm -hmm. which group you're (laughs) talking to. Because on one hand, that's too vague. On the other hand, that's the point is that it's, it is a, reminding us to look at evolution from a particular point of view. So now, with this debate, there are areas where acceptation has flourished. Oh. In evolutionary biology... Has it been exapted? It has been exapted. <laughs> it has indeed. Because while, while in evolutionary biology where it was intended, it has been pretty hit and miss, and I'd say like almost 50-50. There were a number of articles while I was putting together notes for this that I found that acknowledge the term, and then explain why they weren't using it because pre-adaptation was more popular. (laughs) And so, like, 
it is you know it seems to be accepted about as often as it isn't with some people not acknowledging it and then berkeley just it's written on their pages alongside natural selection and other terms <laughs> we recognize the term exaptation has been used for this purpose we also recognize that that's dumb and we're yes. not gonna do it <laughs> exactly i don't know if i bumped the table i i bumped the leg but i didn't hear a thud there's a funny joke we'll keep it in <laughs> But there are areas where people have found uses for this term that fit very well, very different from evolutionary biology, <laughs> specifically technology. Okay. Historical studies of technology are a place where exaptation is being used quite frequently. In fact, if you go to Google Scholar and put in exaptation, about as many articles are going to be for non-evolutionary things as they will be for topics like this. With the mentality of many times throughout human history, tools have been invented for one specific purpose that then get exapted, co-opted for a different purpose, completely irrelevant to their original purpose. Mm -hmm. That people find a new use for it by accident or on purpose that is sometimes more important than the first use. And this has become a common term now with some examples microwaves microwaves originally were for radar okay and we invented them for radar to bounce it off of things and give us a map of what was flying around us then microwaves were used to heat food because they <laughs> give off heat <laughs> this is like all the stories of things that were designed either for space exploration. There you go. That was going to be the next example. Yep, yep. I was going to say space exploration and war. Yeah, exactly. It's... And then came home. It's like, well, this is great for cutting food. Yeah. Well, so yeah. When now we went to the moon and we have all this Velcro. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So I guess, you know, put it on kids' shoes. Thank you, NASA, because I hated tying my shoes as a kid. <laughs> you know, so that's another big one. One example they gave that I thought was wonderful and is, this is probably the most common, or not this one specifically, but this type, is just reusing now derelict stuff. Uh, steel drums, you know, Trinidadian steel drums, the dun -dun 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 -dun, are just oil drums that have been domed and dented to create different notes. Huh. Like a steel drum isn't a classic instrument that we used to make out of, you know, ancient ores. No, it's, there were steel drums, 55 gallon oil drums that were left over and <laughs> carnival performers in the mid 20th century cut them open and used one in after they dented it with hammers and to make music. That's fantastic. So like stuff like that. And that is rampant. Like go to Etsy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just go to Pinterest or Etsy and find people reusing stuff all the time. I do it all the time because I make miniatures. I go, well, that could be part of a spaceship. <laughs> it's, yep. You're a fuel line now. <laughs> Reusing, one of the, the three R's, <laughs> yes. is technological acceptation. Well, that's real cool. Right? Another area that it has become used in, I found a couple of articles on, is economics. Talking about new entrepreneurial behavior getting used or opening new markets. So a technique used in, say, car sales suddenly is found useful to also be, you know, very helpful in furniture. Oh, I see, I see. You know, and it opens a whole new market for using this skill that had nothing to do with the original or was tangential to the original. Okay, I guess that, that uh, reminds me of when people in the sciences will take a technique... Like, here's a, an equation, a technique that engineers designed yes. to work on boats. We can use that to understand how birds fly or exactly, how sharks yeah. swim. So those kind of ideas, one that you particularly will like, David. Oh, boy. Oh, I bet I know where this is going. It's language. Yeah, I was going to say linguistic acceptation. Linguistic acceptation. The, the paper I read gave two uh, uh, terms. One they, they called functional renewal which is taking a already existent term being used for something and then it gains new meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still being used for the other term, but it also starts to mean, you know, cool. Right. It still means that something is a low temperature. 
but it also means it's awesome. Right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> those kinds of things. But also something they called reusing junk grammar. Terms that have lost their usage. You know, they are outdated. Going balls out referred to steam engines. Mm-hmm. We don't use those anymore. Right. So we have come up with a co-opted... So now it means going crazy. Phraseology for you it, know. yes. And it's... There are terms, you know, verbiages that have been accepted from their original purpose, their original meaning, which is just all throughout language, constantly, all the time. So that's another area where acceptation is being currently used outside of evolutionary biology. Well, that's pretty neat. So the term lives. Yeah. And there is yet still hope for it within evolutionary biology. There are those who have suggested we tweak or redefine the meaning of the term. That we adjust it to be a usable term. Something that does make it distinct, that does make it clear. Right. A compromise that everybody is happy with. So that we can use this term, because it still is a useful term, but right now, many argue is too vague. Not everyone argues, but many do. Some have argued for replacing it with a different term that's potentially more palatable. Uh, Buss et al. suggests the term co-opted adaptation. Okay. To say that it is just a form of adaptation, but one that is using a previous structure. Right. You know, limited to traits that evolved after it's been co-opted. This was suggested actually not too long after the term came out. So just, oh no, a little over a decade actually, but still. This was one of those early, you know, 1998, where they were already saying, maybe not that. A really extensive dissection of the term is in Larson et al., which looked at why is this term being so useful in the technologies and not so equally accepted in evolutionary biology. And one of the conclusions they came to is that in technology, you can obviously see the Original intended purpose of the technology right, right. and the second or secondary adaptation. You can watch the evolution happen. Yes. You can clearly go through the history books. This tool was for hitting people. Now we hit baseballs with it. You know, et cetera, et cetera. While in evolutionary biology, you can't confirm those two states as much because technologies are purposeful. Right. Guided there's a, there's change. Intent. We, on purpose, started using it a different way because we saw that. In biology, there is not intention. There is not theological change going toward a purpose. But in certain cases, there can be. Artificial selection, where we select for domestic animal traits, is a case where animals are biologically changing with intent and where we are using features of the animal evolved for survival to now benefit us in different ways. Okay. Larson suggests acceptation only apply to evolutionary situations where clear intended purpose was involved. Right. So as we are selectively breeding dogs and horses and such, we can see the intent just like any sort of technology. Yes. You were not evolved to be able to detect drugs. But your good sense of smell for hunting now is used for that. Right. Co-opted. Co-opted. So he suggests that we redefine the parameters of the term to specifically only apply to one type of evolution. You know, of evolutionary change, so to speak. And acknowledges not all cases will fit neatly into the dichotomy uh, they created. But that's their solution. The final one, which I will admit is my preferred interpretation. It's how I interpreted it when I first heard the definition and didn't realize that was not the commonplace until I saw the debate. There was actually a a blog post I found, or not a blog post, but a a website post of what scientific terms need more exposure. Okay. And in response to that, Tecumseh Fitch, a professor of cognitive biology, wrote a, a small essay on the term acceptation, why it's a fascinating term, and why has it not risen to the same levels of natural selection and adaptation and other terms we use so frequently. They suggest that the term is fine, 
but right now it's too vague into what it exactly refers to in the process of evolution, or at least how much of the process it refers to. They suggest that exaptation is the moment that something is co-opted for another purpose, after which point it just becomes an adaptation again once natural selection starts selecting for you to become a better flyer. Right, which is sort of how we've been talking about it. And that's how a lot of things, even in the original paper, they describe it as that, that you are adapting feathers for insulation. They're exapted for flight. You adapt them for better flying. So this would be, uh, uh, it's basic, I guess, as opposed to calling a trait an exaptation, it's not that flight feathers are an exaptation. They are an adaptation. They Yeah, they but were... at one point... That, that the process of exaptation led to yes. the adaptation of flight feathers. They, at one point, were exapted into the adaptation we know now. Right, right. And that's what they're suggesting here, is that you would, you would basically find a cycle. Things being adapted, a feature of it is exapted, and then is now being adapted... That feature is now being adapted for a different purpose. Right. Exaptation is the name of the transition. Yes. Between adaptations. And they point out that this means that something you could call an exaptation would last for a very short evolutionary time. Mm -hmm. Maybe a, if they say a few thousand generations where the trait is in the process of being repurposed and is not yet a being selected for new feature right these fish are making this noise when they eat and for the past couple hundred generations when they eat other fish hear it and come by yeah to, to see what's going on this, other fish are starting to listen to it but it's not being selected for yet right 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 yeah you know, and it's so this <laughs> is a new form of the term where it is just at the transition point i do kind of like that that's that's how i thought exaptation was meant to be used when I first heard of the term and it was only after reading things that I realized other people were looking at as a category for things to be filed into and so this is this was what I always assumed which I'm glad then I found someone who proposed this as <laughs> this is how we should be looking at it because now that does make it distinct right right you know and now yeah Exaptation would be basically as common as any other adaptation, but it's the point where it shifts, not the whole wing. This has been a fascinating dive into, we've never really done this before, the, the historical approach to defining a concept. Yeah. We kind of did it in episode 56 when we talked about the development of evolutionary theory, mm -hmm. but it's super cool to get to see how scientists go about recognizing a phenomenon, mm -hmm. characterizing the phenomenon, and then arguing about what should we call it. Yes. And that was uh, probably the most interesting part of when I first read uh, Gould uh, Verba paper, was that one of their big points is that this is an idea that's been here since Darwin. We've just never called it something right it needs a name now. like we've never actually called we called the feature a pre-adaptation but the process of changing the purpose didn't have a name and it's fun that that can happen and then we all have to go yeah but is it a good name Ooh. well and this i've seen this happen with other things before where you'll get uh here's this new group of life or here's this new thing that that we found or this new geographic region and someone goes well we've decided to call it this well we've decided to say that australia and the surrounding area is australasia yeah or we've decided that this ecosystem we're gonna call it this and invariably you will have other scientists go no i'm not calling it that no i'm not calling it that's not this no. one would be better it's like when people argue over what they should call their favorite ship. Yes. Yes. <laughs> are we are we really going to call it Raylo? Everyone's calling it Raylo and yeah. I just don't agree with it's, it. Ew, it just sounds gross. <laughs> it sounds like a, you know, medicinal product. I don't like it. So scientists quibble about that stuff. Yeah. Well, and a lot of times those terms are created uh out of necessity during a study, like uh Right. Yeah, hereafter referred to so that 
this is a study about this thing. We're not going to use 10 words every time yes. we try to refer to so this. So we've given it a nickname. Uh, when I did my thesis report, uh, my thesis study, I had to do that because I was looking at individual elements of the alligator skull and how they change over time. And I had to describe all the points of the bone I put markers on. And there are some of points of those bones that are consistent features, good for marking the shape, that don't have a name because it's just the bump that's there. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I had to be like the dorsal ventral anterior process. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's similar to uh, the discussion. We talked about this in the Q&A about the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. People have suggested there's a significant change in the world. Here's a phenomenon. Should we name it? And then a bunch of other people go, no. And then some people say, yes, but not like that. Name it like this. Yes. And then there's a whole argument about it. And so this it's a fun thing to get to observe. And it happens all the time, which oh, is absolutely. really cool. And to bring our discussion full circle, this is where scientific consensus comes in. We don't eventually vote on in a web <laughs> poll our favorite use of acceptation. Eventually, w enough studies use it in a way that everyone agrees makes sense. And I then start using it in my study. And then you start using it in your study. And then it moves its way into the scientific lexicon. We don't go up and, you know, uh, uh, swear in a new piece of jargon. Right. There's no uh, Merriam-Webster that says, now officially this word is in the science dictionary. Exactly. Over, over a big megaphone. That doesn't happen. <laughs> it just, over time, eventually we do or we don't use that term. It survives the test of time or doesn't. Yes, it is naturally selected. Exactly. <laughs> Well, this has been a fun exploration. I had so much fun diving into the the history and the discussion of this term. And so the blog post will be fun. I'll put up a bunch of these articles, but we'll also put up a couple of the points where people gave their very verbose arguments against. Sure, sure. Not all of those are scientific articles. Some of those are like blog posts on scientific sites. Right. You know, and discussion posts by scientists so it's all still within the scientific community just not a paper because it's not often that you could just get to write a paper because you hate something <laughs> <laughs> right in, in close please find a rant yes <laughs> my musings on the term acceptation i expect to see it in the next scientific journal <laughs> but yeah yeah so blog post as always we'll have that extra information and the news links from mm -hmm. the beginning as typical we release episodes every fortnight. Keep your eye out for the Dragon Con episode, which will be up there soon. It's happening. We promise. <laughs> and once again, if you're on Patreon, send us your questions, because this is time where I would we would have been answering a question. That's true. Check your message, mm -hmm. your messages. You'll have a link to the form. If you have a question, let us know. If you want us to answer your question on the podcast and you're not on Patreon... Go check it out. See if it's something you'd be interested in signing up for. Or feel free to start a conversation on our Facebook page. Yeah. Or in the community on any of our social medias. Thanks again for those who requested this episode. Always. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.